If you read through Ezekiel chapter 22, you will find a very powerful discussion that God is having with His people. He speaks to His people and He says to them that I have noticed in your city that you are a city of bloodshed. He says to them, confront them with the detestable practices and says, say to them, that this is what the Lord, the Sovereign Lord says, O city that brings on herself doom by shedding blood in her midst and defiles herself by making idols. You've become guilty because of the blood you have shed and you've become defiled by the idols that you have made. You have brought your days to a close and the end of the years has come. And then he says, I will make you an object of scorn and a laughing stock to all the countries. Those who are near and those who are far away will mock you, O infamous city, full of turmoil. He speaks to this town and he speaks to God's people. And he says to Ezekiel, I want you to talk to my people. I want you to talk to their hearts and I want you to tell them what I think about their practices. And in the text of chapter 22, he speaks of politically connected men that are strong, but what they actually do is they kill other people for their own gain, and their hands are dripping with blood. He also say that they ignore the poor and the fatherless, and also they pour contempt on all the widows. He says they behave in such an ungodly way that they show contempt for their fathers and their mothers. He also speaks to them and he says that you treat that which is holy as defiled. And you cannot make the difference. You cannot differentiate. Verse 24 he says you are a land that had no rain or showers in the day of wrath. There's a conspiracy of her princess within her, like a roaring lion tearing its prey. They devour people like treasures and precious things, and make many widows, widows within her. Her priests do violence to my law, and profane many holy things, my holy things. They do not distinguish between the holy and the common. And they teach that there is no difference between the unclean and the clean, and they shut their eyes to the keeping of the Sabbath, so that I am profaned. In verse 28, her prophets whitewash their deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. This is what the Lord, the sovereign Lord says when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the Lord land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and the needy and mistreat the alien Denying them justice. It's with that in mind that he says the following that I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land, so I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. It's just coincidental that today is Ryan's one year anniversary. I was raised by a mother when my dad died when I was eight months old, and I never knew him. I reconstructed his history by speaking to people, his best friends, his father, and my family. But there is something that talks to my heart this morning and asks the question, what does God require of us? Although on the one side we are extremely sad about the loss of a father. But during my formative years, I had to look at role models and I found them in the church. I found godly men who would be truthful and who would be honest. Many years later, I sat down and dissected my character. And I found that I was the sum total of all of these men. That have come across my path. I discovered that their role in my life was crucial 
in shaping me into the man that I had become. I also understood that I looked at the lives of other men, how ungodly they behaved, and also how hypocritical lives they led, with a veneer of godliness, but inside they were ungodly, ravenous wolves, full of dead men's bones, and only exhibited a whitewashed tomb. And I understood what David says, we hate every evil deed. And like Jesus says, hypocrisy has no place in God's kingdom. And so the question today is, if it is true that we are living in a society where these things do occur, we find that they slandered and gossiped about each other. We found that they dishonored their wives and their families. They judged and twisted the law of God for their own benefit. They decided which law was going to be obeyed and which law we're going to exempt certain people from obeying. They violated young women and girls and they found that it was okay and they looked the other way. Today the question on the table is, what is the greatest clarion call that God will have for us? And I would like to say the following, that in the life of Jake and Anna, more so than ever, God requires godly men that are going to be better fathers. Godly men that God still searches for, that will show young children how it is to be godly. They need godly fathers, better fathers, that will be prepared to stand in the gap and honor God with their lives. A recent study revealed the following, that fatherless homes are five times more susceptible to suicide. 32 times more likely for children to run away. 20 times more likely to have behavioral disorders. 14 times more likely to commit rape. Nine times more likely to drop out of school. Ten times more likely to abuse alcohol and drugs. Nine times more likely to end up in state-operated institutions. The call for godliness among God's men is more now than ever before. God needs us to show to our children what godliness is looks like. I'd like to examine some of the things that God really needs. But I want to begin firstly by saying what God does not need. He does not need fathers who will pitch their tent towards Sodom. And what that means is that he needs a father that will not be materialistic. Where success is measured in the bank account, yet there is spiritual bankruptcy evident in his life where he will find that being with his children and trying to mentor and stay in touch and connect with their children, far more precious than trying to, con con to spend time with his karnuata. Chapter 13 in the Bible of Genesis tells us that Abram and Lot discovered a land around them, and this land could not support them both. And so they needed to make a decision as to how they were going to Depart from each other. And Abraham, our father in the faith, gave Lot the choice. And scripture tells us that Lot looked around and he saw the riches of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, that is where I want to be. That is where I want to pitch my tent. I want you to know that the Bible speaks about Lot's concern for his family's well-being. He only saw material he all only saw that which could enrich and that which could physically make his life comfortable. But we understood and we understand from the word of God that this ultimately led to the destruction of his family. When we look at number two fathers that we don't need, we do not need fathers who refuse to set boundaries and limits for their children. We don't need an ungodly father that feels that it is okay for his children to sin and to carry on in ungodly behavior and say nothing. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 12, 17 and 24, we find out that Eli did not restrain his sons. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 2 says, Eli's sons were scoundrels and had no regard for the Lord. 
Verse 25 says, Eli had allowed their behavior to run wild so long that even when he tried to rebuke them, they refused to listen to him. When you raise a rebellious child, it's the hardest child to bend to God's will. They will show their rebellion and they will show their refusal not to listen to you. We find that Eli set no boundaries. He had no rules. He could not say no to his children's behavior. They didn't listen because they never felt the weight of parental punishment. They never understood what it is to say no. They never understood what it is when a father sits down his children and say, this behavior is not part of this family. God does not need men that are ungodly and refuse to discipline their children. We are reminded in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2, to honor your father and mother so that all will go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life. You must understand that the fathers are responsible for the behavior of his children. Because in that same passage, he says, do not provoke, do not exasperate your children. In other words, don't frustrate them, but train them in the instructions of the Lord. Proverbs 29, 15, and 17, the rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to himself disgraces his mother. When the wicked thrive, so does sin, but the righteous will see their downfall. Discipline your son, and he will give you peace. He will bring delight to your soul. We need fathers who will discipline their children. Discipline does not mean punishment, hitting the child within an inch of his life. It's not what it is. Discipline takes place when hearts of a father meets the heart of his children. In the third place, we need fathers who are, we don't need fathers who are dishonest before their children. And this is crucial, brethren, because this honesty is modeled by a father. You see, sometimes, brethren, we give the impression of great stewardship, but inwardly we are liars and we teach our children to how to lie. In Joshua chapter 6, it's a powerful passage where an entire nation was laid bare. We know when they tried to tackle Ai, one of the smallest nations of the world, 300 men died on that day. And then what happened was Joshua came and, and God told him that there's sin in the camp. God said to him, there's sin in the camp. You deal with it. And what we say is, no, 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 no. God says, you better sort this out because it'll affect the entire nation. We find that Achan showed his children. And what he did was something that God specifically prohibited. He took, all the, he took silver, gold, bronze, and iron, which belonged to the Lord. And he hid it in his tent. The implication from the text, when you read it, tells you that his children saw it. He had seen how you are still. He had seen how you are still. He had seen how you are still. And what happened was his entire family was lost. You see, brethren, our own acts of dishonesty affect our children. They are influenced by our hypocrisy. Godly fathers must be honest. You must be truthful. We don't need fathers who set a tone for unrighteousness. We have a rich history in the Bible. Jeroboam was the first king in the northern kingdom of Israel. We have an open opportunity and we watch how he starts to rule this nation. But what this man did as a ruler of God's people, he chose to take the advice of unrighteous men and walk in stubbornness of his own heart. Now it's interesting to note the following, brethren, that his own son Nadab, when he had become king, followed in his father's footsteps. And you can read about this in 1 Kings 15:26. It tells us that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the ways of his father, counting, causing Israel to commit the same sins. In other words, he watched his father. He watched his dad listen to ungodly men. And then he did exactly the same. And he led an entire nation, an entire church, an entire people 
down the road of destruction. You see, Paul still said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Follow me as I follow Christ. The mark is Jesus. And we must stop making excuses that we are only human. No, we are Christians. I remember many years ago when I played for my school. I loved rugby and I loved athletics. And Mr. October got up one day and he took our uniform. And he says, I want to tell every single one of you. When you put on this shirt, you represent the school. And I will find you wherever you are. If you ever disrespect the school, I will deal with you right there. When we wear the cloth of Christ and the blood of Christ has washed our, our sins away. And we have the Holy Spirit living within us. God owns us. And every aspect of our life becomes submissive to him. And so when we wear that uniform and we run onto that field, you're not your own. You're under the command of the coach. And you obey and you do what you're told. We need fathers. Then what do we need? We need fathers like Enoch who walked with God. Genesis 5, 21 to 24, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Enoch walked with God, with God. then he was no more because God took him away. Hebrews 11 verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. We learn from this man that he was not just a good man. He was a godly man. Because he walked with God, he was a man with faith. A man of faith and a man who pleased God, that God would call him his friend. Our children need to see us being men of faith, godly men, men that are definitively defined, not by all the things and the kingdom of kingdom, but a man that exemplifies the cross of Christ and lives a crucified life. We need men like Noah, who was a teacher of righteousness. Noah never saw rain, but the story goes that he preached for 120 years. 300 years, that town or that city or that whole area never had rain. Many of the people that came and went and lived and died never knew what rain looked like. But yet he kept on preaching. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord according to Genesis chapter 6 verse 8 and 9. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He also walked with God. Proverbs 14:34 says, righteousness exalts a nation. Now, if righteousness exalts a nation, does it then mean that righteousness exalts a church and righteousness exalts a family? Then we look at the life of Abraham. He was the father of the faithful to all who believe. In Romans chapter 4, we hear a wonderful account of him. And we know that he was faithful to the Lord. In the fourth place, we know also that we want to bring us to the fatherhood of Isaac. A father who blesses his children. A man who not only is a blessing to his wife, but also a blessing to his children. Many years ago, Gary Smalley wrote a book called The Blessing. And Smalley gave four ingredients that will bless our children from the life of Isaac. The first thing that he mentions in this idea, in the life and fatherhood of Isaac, was that he had the meaningful touch. In Genesis 27, verse 21 and 22, Jacob went close to his father and Isaac touched him. The Hebrew culture is full of this imagery. The idea of touching the laying on of hands, a kiss and an embrace, tells the person that they are loved. That they are accepted. Many times people ask the question in this congregation. When we hug our children. 
It's a meaningful touch. It's not an inappropriate touch. It's a touch that tells that child that you're accepted and you are loved. That you're important. That I will stop and I will come to your level and I will hug you because you're important. In the second ingredient that Smalley speaks about, he speaks about the spoken message of love and affection. Can I ask you a question, fathers? How often do you tell your children that I love you? How often do you tell them that I am proud of the decisions that I watch you make? How many times do you tell them that you make us, your mom and your dad, so proud Of the life that you live. You make us so proud. That when people see you in the public social sphere. That your behavior is beyond reproach. How many times have you told your children. That we are thankful that God had entrusted you to us. That we are so grateful that we have you. The other night my wife. We were going settling down to pray. And my wife made a comment to me and she said, are the chickens all inside? And I said, yes. And then we prayed and thanked God that they were all home. How many times do they, you thank God that your children are indoors? Or do you just hope that wherever they are, they'll be safe? The third blessing is assuring our children of our acceptance and their value. In verse 28, Isaac says, May God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's riches. May he bless you with an abundance of grain and new wine. How many times do you sit with your children and say, May God bless you from heaven materially. May he bless you. May he give you from his store. I think it was Anna Marie that told us a story many years ago about a few children sitting around and they were at a kiddie's party. And the father walked around with a big packet of sweets. And as he walked around, he said to the kids, he passed the packet around and he says, take as much as you want. And these little hands just dived into the packet and grabbed all the sweets that they could. And as they closed their hands and they pulled the sweets up, there were sweets falling out. But boy, they held on to those sweets for dear life. And they put them in their laps and they, they were eating away. And the last child, the last child said the following. He said, no, sir, will you give to me? And the father said, okay, open your hands. And the child did this. And they asked the child, why do you do that? He says, his hand's bigger than mine. Do you get it? Sometimes we go around lying and cheating and and bribing people for money in this country. So that we can be successful in the eyes of the world. Yet we don't want to hold out our hands and say, Lord, I'll wait my turn. Did you know one of the characteristics of successful people is the ability to defer. It's to defer gratification. And said, I will wait. Psalms 46 verse 10, wait on the Lord. In his time, he will bless you. And when God gives, he says, yes, sir, I'm ready. So, because when it drops, it drops into your lap anyway. Don't grab. And that is why a father tells his children, may God bless you. May he bless your home. May you give you even more than you have. Or I was able to give you. Blessing number four, give them a picture of a glorious future. Verse 29, may nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. May your sons and your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. And this is the key. God is painting a glorious picture of relationships that anyone that comes against you and curses you behind your back, God will curse them. But he says, you will be my blessing. And so many times we need to learn that God wants us to have our children rise to expectations of a future that we can illustrate to them that he can give beside this world. We come to the New Testament. 
In the New Testament, we find the story of the prodigal son. And what's so amazing about grace is a book written by Philip Yancey, one of the finest writers that I was blessed to read. And it tells a story of a modern prodigal daughter who grew up in Travis City in Michigan. She became so disgusted with her old-fashioned father, whom she believed overreacted to her body piercings, her short skirts, the music she listened to, the tattoos, and a drug habit. And so what she did was she ran away. She ends up in Detroit where she's employed as a prostitute because that's all that she can do. But you see, what happens in the world is things go well for a while. And her beauty is still fresh and things are just great. And, and all the men just want her and she's living the high life. But soon beauty fades. And even as she watched the destitution setting in in her life, she breaks from her pimp. She sleeps on the streets, eats at the dumpsters. And one night she thinks, my dog at home has better food than I have. And so what she does is she phones her father. She says, mom and dad, I want to tell you today, I was wondering about maybe coming home. Because they're not answering the phone, she leaves this message on their phone and she says, I'm going to take the biggest chance of my life and I'm going to catch a bus and I'm going to come home tonight. I will be there at midnight tonight. If you're not there, I will understand and I will get back on the bus and I will leave. And during the bus ride, she had seven hours to prepare a speech for her father. She walked into the terminal, not knowing what to expect. It was late at night. And then that night, she saw a group of 40 people. Brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins and grandparents, even great-grandparents. And then she sees her dad. And she runs into her father's open arms and she starts her speech. And she says, hey, dad. And her father interrupts her. And says, be quiet. He says, we have no time for that. No time for apologies. We are late for your party. Because the party is not here, it's at home. Let's go. And so many times we run away from being rebuked. We run away from actually being counterintuitive and facing up how our behavior has affected the lives of other people. And sometimes we even try to stop others. But what we do expect is love because we have an example. We have an example that Jesus says that godly fathers are forgiving. A repentant heart God does not turn away from. We see another good man, the father Jairus. And we watch how he sits aside at his daughter. He falls to the feet of Jesus, begging for his daughter's life and for her healing. We see three very important concepts that fathers must learn. The first one is being not ashamed to seek out Jesus. She saw that her father was not ashamed to bring Jesus into their home. <clears throat> and fathers, it's our responsibility to not be ashamed of Jesus. At one of the schools my son was at at Fairmont High, they had an imam get up to say a prayer. Everybody got up. I said, you, sit down. I taught my son that there is one God, and he names Yahweh, and his son's name is Jesus. And the reason I'm saying that, I am not ashamed of my Lord. Because my Jesus told me, if you're ashamed of me, I will deny you before my father. You see, we are in a nation of political correctness. We are trying to raise our children to fit in, not to stand out. Deuteronomy chapter 6 tells us to instruct our children in righteousness, to be godly. While we're sitting at our dinner table, we walk around the road. When we lay down to bed, we behave like God's children. Thirdly, we saw her father not ashamed to express his love toward her. He humbly went to her and he said to her that I love you. Told her, I want you to lean on God. I'm going to close with a story and then we're done for this lesson this morning. I read a story many years ago and it always struck 
me in the fields, as you would call it. It's about a young child, and him and his dad were going to the circus. Remember when the circus has come to town? Donnie, we couldn't wait to get there. Because we see them setting up the tents, and we watch the clowns doing their balancing act outside. We watch the horses as they're being fed, and all those kind of wonderful things, and the excitement builds. And he tells a story about his dad, and him and his father went there, and as they're about to buy the tickets, they were standing behind a family, a mother and a father with eight children behind them. And you could tell by their dress that they had very little money. And the father stood there, and the lady eventually rung up the tickets, and she said to them, um, and the father looked at the wife and says, we don't have enough money. And this young boy turned around, and he says he watched his father pull out a $20 bill from his pocket and drop it to the ground, and saying to the man, excuse me, sir, I believe this fell out of your pocket. And the gentleman looked at him, and he knew exactly what was going on here. He looked straight at his father, and with tears on his cheek, he replied, Thank you, sir. This means so much to me and my family. And he said that day, him and his dad turned around right there and drove home. They did not go to the circus that night. But he said, I saw Jesus in the life of my dad that night. And he says, after I got <coughs> my head around the fact of not going to the circus, I could never erase the fact of my dad's example. Brethren, the key is this. We need children that's going to be proud of us. We need our children to see Jesus in us all the time. We need to see them not being ashamed of him. God's love is conditional upon repentance. And God wants us to not just be good men, but to be godly men. Men that are defined, not through the kingdom of kingdom, but by how closely we walk with God. I cry for the day that my Lord will call me home and say, Welcome, good and faithful servant. There's a song I want to, I'm not going to sing it to you, so don't be too worried about it. I think we all stand before each other, not as perfect. But there's a song of butterfly kisses that I remember. It's just one refrain, and I'm not going to sing it, so don't worry about it. Where he says, after all that I've done wrong, I must have done something right. To deserve the love every moment. And he speaks about butterfly kisses that he gives to his child every night before she goes to bed. And I imagine us standing before God. And being able to have butterfly kisses with God. We would say, Lord, here I am. Good night. I love you so much. Thank you. Please keep us safe. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you, Lord, that you have become everything to us. If you need to become a child of God today, I want to say this to you. It's the best life you can ever imagine. You walk constantly under the guidance and the presence of God in your life. You start to understand what it is, what God's grace means. You start to understand that you're not perfect. But what you do understand is that you are loved. And that this God that loves you has sent his son and gave his life where it was within his power to destroy every single man who came and crucified him. But instead, he died for them too. Now that's a God that I gladly will give my life to. And if the day will come, I want everyone to know that I was a child of God till the day that I died. Let's stand and sing a song of encouragement.